Welcome to the suburbs of Suffolk. We're here at Castle Hill in Ipswich because the children at the local primary school wanted to know more about the castle that gives this place its name. When we started looking into it, though, we didn't find some medieval stronghold, but something much more exciting. Beneath these well-tended lawns and patios could lie the biggest Roman villa ever discovered in Suffolk. So how big was this building, and what on earth was it doing here? Time team and the people of Castle Hill have got just three days to find out. We know the castle of Castle Hill was actually a villa because of this man, Suffolk archaeologist Basil Brown. Starting in 1946, he spent the years before the housing estate was built compiling a partial plan of a substantial 3rd and 4th century Roman complex. But time ran out before he could dig the whole site and the bulldozers moved in, burying the farmland and his discoveries under a swirling carpet of housing. There is a Roman villa here, we know it's here, um, which is a, a good way to start. We're now here to finish Basil Brown's job and uncover the true extent of the villa that gave Castle Hill its name. And that means digging in at least eight gardens, making it the most ambitious back garden archaeology we've ever done on a regular time team. We've got a reasonable idea that the bulk of the, the villa walls are underneath number 21, which is why we're starting here. First thing we need to do is dig a trench to find some of Brown's walls. And once we've locked his plans into the modern landscape, we can go hunting for the parts of the villa he didn't have time to dig. But that's not as easy as it sounds. I don't want to cast any aspersions on old archaeologists, but it's almost impossible to tie these old plans into the modern landscape. So, you know... Why is that? Well, because they just didn't record things in the way that perhaps they should have done by oh, modern no, that, standards. That, I don't think that's fair, actually, Guy. I mean, Basil Brown, who did the excavations in the 1950s and the other excavations in the 1930s, they did record everything they found in great detail, mm. but the problem is that the landscape's completely changed. You can see this is Brown's excavations here, and it's all just open land, yeah. nothing like this. So they've referenced the trenches to field corners and fence posts, and even buildings like this, huge great big buildings, obvious things to tie your trenches into, but they've all gone now. And they didn't have anything like GPS that could give them actual eight-figure grid coordinates. So they did the best they could, but because the landscape's changed, we don't know exactly where those things were because the references have gone. Jude, you've dug here before, haven't you? Yes, we... There was a little bit that didn't get developed until the end of the 1980s down yes. here. We found a bathhouse in this area here, and we found a timber building, an old timber building about there. So this could be part of really quite a big complex. Oh, yes, yeah, so it, it's, it's really quite an impressive looking range of buildings. If we can find out where it all was and which bits joined together, and that's going to be really difficult to do. We're starting in number 21, Tranmere Grove, because that's where Jude believes the western end of the villa is. And finding a whole mass of walls and corners is essential for establishing how Basil Brown's plan fits into the modern estate. But there is a problem. If our guess is only out by a few metres, we could be digging in the wrong garden. So to cover ourselves, we're also going to dig in number 17 to see if and where it contains evidence of Brown's excavations. We're gambling a lot of our resources on these trenches, but the amount of finds that have already turned up suggests we're on the right track. You've got quite an impressive range of, of material. I can see as we've got Roofing tile. That's right, that's right. What is interesting is that the, this material here um, is all brick from a hypercost or the pili, pili, the pillars that support the hypercost. So we're looking at a building of status, but particularly interesting <laughs> is the fact that we've got this glass. Uh, one burnt fragment, which could be window glass, and a very small fragment of vessel glass. This is almost certainly the base of a, of a shallow, shallow vessel. But I'm certainly encouraged that the level of material certainly um, 
impressive segments of floor material That's that have right. been coming up from this garden area. That's right. That That's gives us some hope. The early geophysics results are also surprisingly good because in spite of the urban setting, they seem to be spotting some very promising features under the lawn. I think we've got, I think we've got something positive. Cool. Um, this is 17, isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, the black is high resistance, so the black should be wall or rubble or, or something like that. Something big coming through. Now, doesn't that match with... Those. Well, in theory, the, the main axis of the, the villa, the east-west corridor, is, is coming through this garden here, so we should get two walls sweeping right the way through. Well, I mean, it's critical from our point of view we actually see some archaeology in the ground and compare it with our results, because it's such a nightmare for us. We're already digging in two gardens and it's not even 10.30. How many we finally dig is down to the patience and hospitality of the residents. Are you happy if we come in here next? Yes. Just to do our survey? Yes. You know, with, with the geophysics? Yes. But the good news is, if we can establish the exact location of Basil Brown's plans, it'll make our search for the rest of the villa complex so much easier, because Romans love their buildings to conform to certain basic rules. There does seem to be a fairly standard pattern that many villas will conform to. And that's what we've been working on. I mean, the, the kind of thing that we might have had here is a simple row of rooms, but it's rectangular with a roof. Now, that's very typical of, of early Roman houses in Britain. And if he gets a little bit more money, he could put on a corridor. So you can see him just generally upgrading his structure, and then he does a little bit more. And then if he gets a bigger family or there's more money available, the, the estate's producing more, he might be able to put on a whole extra wing. With this in mind, we can also guess at the prosperity of the inhabitants. A single range villa would indicate a wealthy man. Two ranges suggest a very rich family, while three ranges covering almost 30 gardens of the modern estate would mean we're looking at the property of an exceedingly rich and powerful dynasty. The next couple of hours are just a blur of digging and scraping. John did say we might have to extend that way, didn't he? He did, he did, and uh, for once I actually agree with him. Just for once? Just for once. The trenches are extended, the diggers dig deeper. All classic day one activity, which yields a huge and so far empty hole in number 21. It's been a bit more tenacious than ever we thought it would, David. It's going down a hell of a way, isn't it? Well, that's it. I mean, we all, all, all thought that you'd literally just take off the yeah. topsoil, a yeah. little bit of subsoil, uh, yeah. and you'd be in the walls yeah, and things like that. And still quite a way to go, obviously. That's the horrifying yeah. thing. The news isn't much better in number 17, where John's crisp geophys results hadn't exactly given us the massive masonry features we'd hoped for. Got the first bit of Roman pottery, so that's a good start. Oh, nice, yeah. It doesn't it doesn't register very high on the thrillometer, but you're quite oh. right, it's Roman. It's it's a piece of black burnished ware, it's a standard piece of kitchenware. Right. Um, very difficult to date that accurately because we haven't got the diagnostic sure, but it's um it's quite a clean piece, isn't it? So Yeah. Um, it may have gone back in the fill from um, Basil Brown's fill uh, factor, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, what true. sort of levels are you down at? Well, we've gone through the topsoil here and we've just come down mm. to this um yeah. kind of rubbly layer here and it's literally yeah. sitting on the top, mm -hmm. just there. Right, okay. It's popped up. So it does look like you're probably still in backfill, doesn't it? Well, I'm not entirely sure. It could well have come from the backfill above uh -huh. it, yeah. Right, okay. Um, there are a couple of oyster shells and stuff down there, so uh -huh. whether it's backfill or not, we're getting, certainly getting domestic stuff now, yeah, whereas yeah. before this entire trench has just been rubble mm. and, and the like. To be fair to Phil and Matt, they have established that they're digging through the backfill of Basil Brown's excavations. It's our first clue that we're roughly in the right place, and there should be some archaeology around here somewhere. Hopefully our diggers will find it soon. Meanwhile, we're going to open up another strand of our investigation, looking for the rest of the complex. Thankfully, the standard design of Roman villas means it's fairly easy to pick our next target. Given the amount of information that's come out so far, what can we tell about the building? The key thing for us is to see, first of all, whether this joins onto this and whether that's what we've got underneath the villa. 
I'm skeptical about this because oh, yeah. you see, I think that it might be sort of a more conventional winged corridor building where which stops at this point. Mm. In other words, this what we see here is reflected here. So you think that might uh, be just a single this, building on an its own? building. I yeah. imagine that that is doing something like that. Yeah. Okay. So in the best of all possible worlds, where would you put in a trench today to begin to sort out those kind of? We've questions? got to go into these gardens right. here. We're both agreed on that. Yeah. We've got to join these two bits up to make sense of what we already know. So these gardens in Chesterfield Drive, the road immediately south of Tranmere Grove, should tell us whether we have two buildings joining together to make a large winged villa or simply two separate structures. And a quick inspection of number 18 suggests that we could be looking at a substantial property. That's not very much, but it's a bit of Roman tile. This is Roman? Yeah, that's Roman tile. How do you know that is Roman, Guy? You can just tell by the shape of the fabric. And there's another piece here. That's a piece of a imbrex, the curved Roman roof tile. Curved Roman uh, roof tile? Well, it's not looking bad so far, is it? <laughs> Easy, this archaeology, isn't it? Yeah. This garden is obviously the best location for our next trench. We're have to try and get into the whole ground here. So you really reckon that this yeah, is yeah. the place? So once GFIs have surveyed it, we can get some diggers in. Meanwhile, back in the Basil Brown trenches, the good news is that we may have found our first wall line in number 17. The bad news is it looks suspiciously like all the stones were removed, robbed out in archaeological speak, during Brown's dig, probably because Brown was trying to see what was underneath. So you're in happy there. that that's actually a, an edge? Well, that's coming, you know, yeah, coming down there. yeah. And you're still in fill. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's not a, a, a nice sort of straight edge to that. That's all been messed about with. Well, you know, it wouldn't be too bad at this point. And if you're rubbing out, you're going to be lifting up lumps out and chucking sure. them. You're going to be running in and out. There's nothing, and if it is 1950s, this doesn't necessarily have to be ancient battering. True, yeah, as you say, if you're taking the, the wall lump out, all that floor level's going to be removed. which is how the mortar out. has gotten from there to the section here yeah. without anything linking it there. So it still looks convincing as a rubbed out wall. Absolutely, yeah. If anything, it's even worse in Phil's trench in number 21. After a day of digging through the detritus of Brown's 50s dig, he's found nothing. It looks like Basil took everything with him. Carenza's been digging through Brown's original archive and she's now discovered another complication. Even if we can locate Brown's plan, the plan itself may not be reliable. I think we're going to have an absolute bloody nightmare, to be quite honest. I think we've no idea what actually existed and what never existed. What did exist once and was destroyed in antiquity. What did exist when Brown dug it and was destroyed by Brown. And, of course, then what's been destroyed when the houses were being built. But what's, what's really bothering me, actually, Tony, is that we've got no trench plan. What do you mean a trench plan? Well, nothing that shows us which areas he excavated and which areas he didn't. I mean, you look at this and it looks as if he's opened up this whole area, and I think that's very unlikely. So a lot of this might be surmise? Yeah, exactly. Hang on, hang on. You were vigorously defending him as being incredibly scrupulous only a few hours well, ago. Well, I was, uh, I was saying I don't don't assume that he's not located it properly. And in fact, you look, he has picked up field boundaries and, and field gate there and buildings and things to measure of. Um, so it may well be that he's located his plans accurately, but that his interpretation of what's going on is actually wrong. Brown has also drawn all of his walls perfectly straight to fit exactly the graph paper he's using, completely changing the appearance of some of the wall lines recorded in his site sketches. Luckily, we have the notes from which he compiled his master plan. Unluckily, there's a lot of them. And if Carenza and villa expert David Neal are to stand a chance of rebuilding an accurate plan, they'll have to go through every page. It's coming to the end of day one, and this isn't the straightforward dig I'd expected this morning. We haven't found enough of Brown's excavations to fit his plans into the landscape, and Carenza says we shouldn't trust those plans anyway. But at least Jeffys have nearly finished surveying their new area. There's also a small reward for all our diggers' hard work. The first real insight into the people who once lived here. What I found it is a really nice piece of shale. Oh, yes. And it looks like it might have been yeah. a bracelet, possibly for a child looking at the size yeah, of it. Right. What's lovely about it is 
it looks like it would have fitted a very small wrist and you notice on the inside of it this yes. wonderful turning marks yeah, you yeah. know of course it's so easy to carve isn't it and they and the romans used it for furniture and all sorts of small pieces of jewelry didn't they they did predominantly bracelets as i yeah. as i understand the thing about it, it's very fragile isn't it so mm -hmm. it would break very easily You only have to knock it if you're walking around. If this was a child's, as you suggest, with the size, very easy for a child to break that, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would be very easy. Miles, this morning we were really excited because we were going to find a lovely big villa and we put the trenches in. And now it's the end of day one. We've got absolutely nothing in that trench over there. And here all we've got is a hole within a hole. What is that? Uh, it's a very exciting hole, actually. It's, uh, it's a line of a rubbed out wall. So we've actually got minus archaeology. Well, not, not really. I mean, this is uh, it's, what we dug this trench originally for was to find the wall alignment that's the alignment there. That's really what we cut this trench for. It's something, but it's not much for day one. Aren't you getting nervous? No, I'm still very optimistic, actually, certainly because of uh, uh, John's geophysical results. Uh, all the trenches we've been excavating so far are re-excavating Basil's trenches. But couldn't they so, all be full of robbed out material? I don't think so. I think the, the, the trenches here are robbed out because they have been excavated. I'm far more optimistic that the ones that we're going to get to the east are, are still going to be there because they haven't been excavated. So you think it might have been Basil himself who actually it, robbed out the walls? It may well have been, yes, yeah. Oh, well, that's uh, <laughs> not quite the perfect archaeologist then, is it? John, have you got something really optimistic for us? Look, the good thing is we've done a couple of gardens away from where Basil Brown did his excavations and we're getting what appear to be clear wall lines. It could be we're filling in the gap where he didn't look. So is that where you want to work tomorrow? Exactly. I mean, this is really the, the missing link between the, the northern range uh, and the eastern block here. If we have got a, a continuous range of rooms here linking the two, so that's where we want to design our trenches and put them in tomorrow morning. And where's this on the ground, John? Well, we're talking about five or six houses that way. Oh, excellent. So we know that we've got a Roman villa somewhere and tomorrow we're going to start trying to dig someone else's Roman villa and head off into virgin territory down this street here. It's the start of day two in Ipswich and somewhere beneath this sea of 50s housing lie parts of a large villa recorded by archaeologist Basil Brown in the mid-20th century. If only we could find it. Funny old trench, and we started off with such big, grand ideas, yeah. and just kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But nobody would have dreamed we had to go down that far. Yeah. They didn't tell us that in the meeting. They said it was about that far down. Well, I mean, you look at all the. Folks. Half our diggers are still stuck in Tranmere Grove, trying to lock Brown's plans into the urban landscape. While Geophys have sent the other half to open trenches in numbers 14 and 18 Chesterfield Drive, where the results suggest there's an eastern wing joining the main villa building. If these results are correct, it'll be the biggest Roman villa ever discovered in Suffolk, if the results are correct. It was described to me as a high-resistance linear anomaly. At the moment, all we got is an anomaly. <laughs> oh, I don't think I'd be glad of any anomaly, to be quite honest. That's it there. <laughs> it's yet another kick in the teeth for Geophys. In fact, the one truly productive trench we have is the one dug by the toddlers in the local nursery. Oh, now that's very interesting. That's a bit of real pottery, real Roman pottery. You find that yourself? Yeah. That's very precious. Oh, yes, that's another stone, isn't it? I can't help feeling we're in a right pickle. No, no. The archaeologists, though, are much more pragmatic. Actually, I think we're making quite good progress towards really working out a strategy, given that we're so, uh, so restricted on where we can dig. I think we're starting to come up with something, We're making we? quite good progress on working out a strategy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it all boils down to the, the same problem we had uh, yesterday in, in trying to actually lock down Basil Brown's plan, trying to work out exactly where he dug and where the main walls were. Basil Brown has got an idea of what he wanted the villa to look like. The problem we've got is that Brown, drawing up this plan, seems to have ignored everything he didn't like or didn't understand and then straightened up anything that didn't 
fit right on his bit of graph paper. So using this plan to then try and predict where features are going to be up here is really difficult. But what we've now found is his original plans, the detailed ones that these were kind of then drawn up from, have got a lot of additional detail that he ignored. So we've almost excavated new evidence from the archives. But where should we dig next? Well, our trenches in numbers 21 and 17 Tranmere Grove have found evidence of Brown's excavations, so we're pretty sure that they're in the vicinity of the western end of the villa. That means the heart of the villa lies east, in and around number 13. According to Carenza, this is where the main dining room is, and so that's where we'll stick our next trench. Oi. It all sounds a bit circumstantial to me, but in spite of any shortcomings, we need to take Basil Brown's record seriously. By many people in Suffolk, he's regarded as something of an archaeological god, but that's because of his association with Sutton Hoo, you know, the famous ship burial, Anglo-Saxon king's burial site. Um, and he was actually paid by the landowner, Mrs Pretty, to come in and do the excavation there. And she clearly really rather liked him, because when it became apparent how important Sutton Hoo was going to be, the Office of Works, the government, as it were, sent in Charles Phillips to oversee the excavations. And Phillips got rid of just about everyone else except Basil Brown, and he couldn't get rid of him because he was being paid by the landowner and he had no jurisdiction over him. So Carenza and villa expert David Neal will stick with Brown's archive, no matter how long it takes to sort the archaeological wheat from the chaff. We don't yet know. But where is it? Well, that's right. <laughs> it could be one of these three. Or yet another. Pillar detail number one, but he's got, not got them numbered he here. He hasn't got them numbered. It may be, though, but from they may the be records keyed in. we will be able to sort that out. One yeah. thing they're now sure about That's is that there's not right. just one, but several phases of villa. David also believes a bathhouse once stood on the site of the trench in number 21 Tranmere Grove. It's just a pity that all the archaeological evidence of it seems to have been removed by Brown. Over in numbers 14 and 18 Chesterfield Drive, we wanted to establish if the villa had an eastern wing. But the trenches we put in this morning, targeted on crisp geophys results, have been disappointing to say the least. Phil, to my untutored eye, this looks like another trench with nothing in it. That's because you're looking at another trench with nothing in it. <laughs> I'm learning, isn't <anyway. laughs> <You can't. laughs> Why? There was fantastic geophys. The geophysics were quite clear there was this big linear anomaly running down the length of the trench. And I mean, this was always going to be a crucial trench because it was going to tell us whether or not the main wing that runs um, east-west actually was going to turn round and come straight down here. Clearly it doesn't. So he's going to tell me that this trench is a great well, success. <laughs> it is. It tells it, us it, that... The Roman villa isn't here. It, it, it is a great success in the fact that it tells you that the Roman villa is not there. In other words, it answers the question of mm. whether or not the Roman villa comes down here. We can now confidently say that these empty trenches mean there's no eastern wing of the villa. These are separate self-contained buildings. It looks like the villa isn't as big as we thought it was, nor its owners quite as rich. I thought this was going to be an easy time to. We <laughs> knew there was a villa here. We've got drawings to show where it was. Well, we can, we can be a bit positive about this. We do know that the Romans were here because... Look what came out on the spore tip from the metal detector. All right, Mastermind, tell us what this is. Interesting lady, that's Faustina Junior, who's the wife of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, who reigned from 161 to 180. If you remember the... Nice old gentleman at the beginning of the film Gladiator. Richard Harris. That's the man. Now, this is the mother of Commodus, that thoroughly unpleasant emperor who features throughout the film. But the coin is very worn. It could have been lost any time up to the middle of the 3rd century AD easily. Look, she's got a little grin on her face. She's laughing at us. Bunch of incompetence we are. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go and wreck another garden. <laughs> Well, Phil's wish has come true, and he's now in charge of the latest Basil Brown trench in number 13, Tranmere Grove. Oh, this is a bit better. But we haven't given up on the west of the site. All these gardens still need geophysing, and there's a chance that the villa may have a western wing. 
So Guy and John have set about tracking down the last few neighbours who still haven't agreed to have their garden surveyed and, if necessary, dug up by a mini-digger. Oh, oh, right, OK. Well, thank you very much indeed, anyway. Okay. Okay. Sorry to disturb you. Okay. Cheers, okay. thanks. Oh, what's that? Is that the same stuff? It's a bit more different, doesn't it? Back in number 13, Phil may have discovered some vital locating evidence. Or at least evidence of something that used to be here. Huh, could this be Basil's excavations yeah. as well? Could he have had this lot out? Mm. See if it lines up with any of the... Getting to be a bit of a pain, isn't it? <laughs> This robbed-out wall is virtually identical to the one found yesterday. It shows the same evidence of the stones being removed so that archaeologists could see what's underneath. This is an occupational hazard of digging on a site that's already been investigated, although the old adage, all archaeology is destruction, seems to be particularly appropriate on Castle Hill. But it hasn't stopped our team inventing a new expression for it. It looks like um, it, it, it's been basled in the sense it's already been dug out. <laughs> so this bit here is on a plane and this bit's not. Uh, Basil's had his, had his wicked way with that. If it is here, it hasn't been basled. For our team, a trench that's been basled means it's been left so thoroughly excavated by Brown that there's nothing left to see. But at last, Phil has made a breakthrough. In number 13 Tranmere Grove, he's found our first bit of proper, unbasled archaeology. Phil, for one and a half days, you've been surrounded by nothing but fresh earth. Is that real archaeology? That is some of the most spectacular archaeology you'll see for some time, I assure you. What is it? It's a Roman hypercore system, the underfloor central heating system. Look, there's the actual floor surface, and then below that you've got this stack of one, two, three, four, five piloi, big slab uh, tiles that are in a stack and the central heating revolves around them. And what's that brown clay behind you? Well, that I think is the natural bedrock. You see, the point is that what I'm standing in is a, is a trench that Basil Brown dug in the 50s. Is and this a trench that he dug because there was a wall here already? Well, I think what happened was that he probably started his excavations over there and got into the line of a, a robbed out wall that was filled up with demolition rubble and he literally burrowed his way along through here following the demolition rubble and he literally must have gone through here. So at last we've got something tangible. Definitely, yes. I mean, we, we dug this trench to, to find a bit of Basil's excavations, to find something recognisable that he found, so we could actually lock down his plan and make sense of it. And as Phil said, we, we got part of the wall and we got the hypercourse. Well, this is obviously a great step forward in British archaeology, but actually all we've discovered is something that archaeologists discovered first 50 years ago, isn't it? Well, technically, yes, but it, it gives us a chance to, to better fix his plan and also it gives us a chance we've got uh, undisturbed you know, Roman archaeology heading out into the room. So if that's new, does that mean that everything under here would be new as well? Absolutely brand spanking new archaeology, Tony. Result? These little stacks of tiles, or pili, would have supported an ornate floor and are a clear indication that we found a hypercaust, the sophisticated underground heating system that rich Romans reserved for their best rooms. After all this frustration, we finally got a trench that not only has some fantastic new archaeology, but also provides us with our best locating evidence for Basil's excavations so far. Surely, Mars, we need to know more about where the walls are. What You'd think everyone would be happy now, but there's a new problem, a major disagreement about digging strategy. Carenza and David are keen to spend more time and resources excavating areas that have already been dug in an attempt to make sense of Basil's confusing plans. If we can locate one or two more of those, then I think the interpretation of this building is fixed. While Miles wants to find the rest of the villa. If we can get into another garden and, and put another trench in, I'm, I'm happy doing that, but I'm, I'm cautious to agree to anything here Why without actually seeing... Why are you happy to do a trench in another garden but not carry on where we actually got some grass? Because I'm, we've hit um, the north wall. Well, I'm hoping we've got suddenly got the south wall within the area of the trench. I haven't been up there to actually see that in a, in a while. The trouble is the area that we're hoping to extend southwards actually goes into another set of gardens, so we come into a different problem if we're, we're coming into, into that area. Phil to Miles. Come in, Phil, over. Uh, Miles, I think you better get yourself over to the garden of number 13. It's looking really, really interesting. And by the way, can you bring some labour with you? That sounds promising. On my way. 
Thankfully, Phil comes to the rescue. OK, you've got a rubbed out wall, and that corresponds with that line there. Right. At the other end of the trench, you've got a rubbed out wall there. Right. So it looks as though the yellow and the brown is defining what's left of the interior of the building. Or the untouched sort of rubble material. Yeah. Yeah. On that basis, we might have a corner there. Because the, the yellow and brown, the interior seems to stop. So what we're saying is, if we put a trench in there, we may get your rubbed out wall coming through and turning at that point there. And then we've got well, the dimensions And then we've room. got an east-west. Got, got nothing to lose. No. I no. mean, if there's archaeology there, we should find it. We should probably be highly relieved. Well, be and, it, and, it, and if it's basil again, we can just dig it out. Even though it's another rubbed out wall line, we know it once contained a wall, making it vital locating evidence. It also means we can reach a compromise in the dispute over resources. A new small sister trench in the garden of number 13 should give Carenza and David the information they need. I mean, I do feel that this garden is the one chance we have here to open up a reasonable area, see what's here, and then try and interpret it against the plan and try and understand what was going Indeed, on. Indeed, it it's a nice discreet little feature, and hopefully, if it's all contained within this garden, um, and if the owner's happy for us to extend there, then, then by all means, we can get, hopefully, dig that area and find that returning wall. While Miles has now got enough diggers to open a trench in another garden in Chesterfield Drive, this time to see what's happening southwest of the main villa range. It's at this moment that the children who first invited us here turn up to see what we've done. Their timing couldn't be better. Any earlier, and I'd have given them detention for bringing us to one of the most confusing and confounding sights I've ever encountered on Time Team. Instead, they get the full Phil Harding lecture on archaeological stratigraphy. So one of the things that we're trying to do is to unravel the sequence of events that's happened on a site in a trench. So if we can find a coin of, let's say, 300 in there, the likelihood is that the next coin is going to be earlier than that, if it's in this layer, because it's going underneath. This layer is earlier than that layer. We've just about reached the end of day two, and after eight trenches in six different gardens, we're finally getting somewhere. Honest. Our latest trench in Chesterfield Drive has proved to be empty, so there's no western wing. This villa is shrinking before our eyes, as is the wealth of its occupants. But it also means that all our archaeological resources can now be concentrated on the gardens of Tranmere Grove. But that's tomorrow, and before the final push on this exhausting, frustrating site, there's time for some archaeological brain food. Beer and sausages. Beginning of day three in our search for the lost Roman villa here at Castle Hill in Ipswich. We've already put in seven holes into six back gardens. Now it's number eight, but we've got a few problems. We're going to have to demolish that carport because we need to get the mini digger in. In addition, there's this fence that's going to have to come down. And down here, there's a cat's grave, which is pretty newly dug. So clearly we're going to have to keep away from that. Miles, why are we creating all this mayhem? Well, we're trying to find the eastern limits of the, the villa, Tony. Our excavations in the gardens of the south found absolutely no Roman masonry there at all. So it's clear that if there is a, an end to the villa, it's going to be somewhere in these gardens. OK, so it's around here somewhere, but where? If we look at this end, we've got another blob that could just be real. <laughs> After two frustrating days of chasing Basil Brown's plans over half of North Ipswich, we may be finally about to establish the true size and shape of this villa. We know from our empty trenches to the south that it's a single range structure. Now, in number seven Tranmere Grove, we have John's geophys results lining up perfectly with Basil's last recorded eastern wall lines. This could be the break we're looking for. In spite of the havoc we've wrought around Castle Hill, the residents have shown amazing tolerance, even inviting us to dig more trenches in their already scarred gardens. So you, you say you found a wall around here when you put yeah, your fence in? when I was digging this fence post, um, there's a wall, or a little piece of right. flint wall, down there somewhere. It's about a spade and a half depth there. Well, what uh, I'll do is I'll put a hole in here about a metre yeah. square, yeah. 
and we'll see if we can find yeah. it again. Yeah. And would you believe it? While Basil Brown and Gia Fizz have confused us, local knowledge appears to have come up trumps. What have you got in this one, Dan? I think it's our first um, definite piece of Roman wall. That sounds pretty positive. <laughs> oh, I'm always positive, Stuart, when I find yeah. something as good as this. Does it look um, disturbed at all not by Basil Brown? No, not at all. It's solid. I mean, the mortar's in excellent condition. The nodules haven't been bashed around or anything. It, it's, it's absolutely pristine. That's, that's rather nice, isn't Great, it? I mean, isn't that's it? brilliant. What was yeah. it? It's brilliant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, this is kind of a key little hole, yeah. this one, isn't it? Yeah. That square here looks like it might be another of those stacks of yeah. peloid tiles. Yeah. Over in Phil's trench, the hypercourse he discovered yesterday just gets better and better. I'll extend the trench along here, get a pick and shovel, and we'll actually see whether we can get any more of those and also the entrance of the flue. We now have a mix of features from numbers 17 and 13. Phil's hypercourse system, robbed out walls from Brown's excavations, and a hint of some solid archaeology in Dan's trench. It's exactly this sort of information we need to tell the story of this villa. At last, our dig is going according to plan. Or at least it was. We thought that we might find the end wall of the villa here, in the back garden of number seven, but there's absolutely no sign of it at all. And there doesn't seem to be any point in digging in number nine, because if it had been in number nine, we'd have found the rubble from it in number seven. So another hour, another garden, another trench, we're gonna start digging in number 11 to see if we can find it here. Good morning, thanks for letting us dig, yeah. But the problem is that number 11 is right next to where we thought the heart of the villa was. So the trench and the villa seems to be shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Have we any reason to think that it might be here other than desperation? <laughs> well, look, we've got our strongest signals grouped around here. We're in number 11 now and they appear to stop at that point, which is over here. So, I mean, I think... The last trench in Certainly, here. I think uh, this, this is going to be our best bed, I think, for getting that eastern end, which we've been searching for for so long. But I don't understand. I thought that, according to his drawings, the villa went way, way off in that direction. Indeed. I mean, we've been searching for the eastern end of the villa in the gardens right over there. But it looks suspiciously like a lot of this eastern wall coming along here is actually wishful thinking on, on his behalf. He's actually sort of uh, guessing that the, the line is continuing off in the distance, when in reality it's, it's stopping somewhere in this area. So we've been looking for things that aren't really there. We've been trying to imagine that we can see them um, simply because we thought the plan suggested that. OK, so this is our final throw. Yes. But that nice gentleman there, he's not going to like us very much if we try and get the mini digger through his garage, is he? No, we've got a rather e easier option. It's actually taking down this fence and driving the machine straight through. Can we do that? I think we can. Oh, excellent. Slide this out. <laughs> <laughs> After chasing so many archaeological apparitions, maybe at last we'll find the true location of the East Wall. Although Geophys results have let us down before on this site. That's not a wall, is it? Uh, no, it's, it's the geophysical anomaly, though. <laughs> a <laughs> mid-20th century anomaly? Yeah, but it's brick, it's tile, it's rubble. I can't date things. Yeah, it's not villa, so what do we do? Will it be further down? We, we can't go down, it's going to be too disturbed. We, we need to look there. Over here? Yeah, we'll get, get Kerry to open up a new area in there and... Uh, right, so we go. that was our final throw, and this is our final final throw. And this really is our last chance. We only have a couple of hours left, and with so many other trenches still being recorded, completed, or in some cases still being dug, we just won't have enough time to dig elsewhere. But at least David and Carenza are now reaching the end of their dig through Brown's archives, and they're at last making sense of the different phases of the building. 
I always think of archaeology as basically an outside activity, but you two have been stuck in here for two and a half days and you've shown no desire to come out at all. Well, we've ventured out from time to time, but, I mean, basically we've been digging through Basil Brown's archive and it's every bit as confusing as the trenches, really. I mean, you, you just look at this, you see, this is Brown's field notes and you see here we've got an area here and he clearly says building there. You look at the exact same area when he's sort of got home and drawn it up, this is exactly that area. There's a whole load of additional walls, and he calls it a park. So, essentially, you two are like those policemen in old movies who get all the evidence from uh, an unsolved murder and, and reinterpret it. Discover new uh, clues, exactly. It. That's right. We've been rethinking these plans, and um, what we've probably got is an aisled hall, this area here being the hall, the hypercourse that we've got in the other trench That's being the, the triclinium, the main reception room, but it also helps explain this foundation that Brown found to the south, which is almost certainly a porch in the porticus or the passageway fronting the building, running through here. These, yes. these archives have almost been like an archaeological dig. You know, 90% of the stuff that comes out of the trench isn't of interest. It's back for rubble. It's nothing to do with anything. But there's that 10% which is telling you something. And really, these archives That's have right. been exactly like that. 90% has been no use, but the 10% yes. is there, something it, we can really yes. use. Yes. With a bit of luck, we should be able to come up with two or three phases of drawing of the villa on this site, really from the archives and the trenches will be able to tell us where it was and with a bit of luck, a bit of dating evidence. We've also solved another question we set ourselves. Why build a villa here in the first place? Yeah. Does the 3D modelling help us understand the site any better? Yeah. Think? Well, I, I think so because basically what we've got here now, I've take, taken a wide swipe of the whole area. You can, mm -hmm. you can see the river running through, through here and our site is a little red dot just there. Um, and what, what it sort of shows really is that the, the top of the hill is well to the north of us, just this sort of mm -hmm. lighter area. And what we see be is on almost a promontory of land, south facing. The, the geography that you're highlighting here is, is kind of a pattern that you see elsewhere in Suffolk in the Roman period. I mean, these other two red dots here are where there's been other settlements found in the vicinity of ours. Yeah. And you seem to get a pattern of these settlements close to, to river valleys. And along major routeways, for instance, there's a major Roman road from Colchester to Codnam coming up, up here. And here you've got access from the sea, it makes it kind of a key place. So right. all the conditions are, are, are here, immediately below our site, which yeah. led to the growth of, of, of Switch as it is now. I want a flu for a hyper course. That's right. And I've got it. This is the floor. It is this, the channel of the hypercoast yeah. is filled up with a lot of rubbish yeah. in there. Yeah. Now along this side, you come straight onto the clay. Right. And so the bit that you couldn't see, because I covered it up with muck, is that here, you actually got, oh. there's flecks of charcoal on it, it too. Right. There's the floor of the channel. It comes along there, right. and then it, it comes, comes back, back up, up through there. and it goes back along there. Towards, towards the furnace. And back along there. Right. This whole thing is like we thought. Yeah. A big central channel, channel. and there's the base there's, of it. There's the base of the flue. So as well as the pili that supported the hypercost, Phil's now found the flue which would have led to the source of the hot air. It's also a boundary between the rich and poor of Roman Ipswich. Outside, a slave would keep a fire burning, while inside, the well-to-do owners would enjoy the benefits of the hot air circulating underneath their feet. It also now looks as though at last we've found the eastern wall of the incredible shrinking villa. Right. It's been robbed out and it's full of uh, stone, masonry, roof tile. tile and mortar, which is more important. And that's, that's what you're in That's now, what I'm stood in here now. And from here on, we've got the inside of the building where there's obviously been a lot of fire, whether the building has burnt down. You can see here, you've got oh, roof right. tile absolutely stuffed full of charcoal. Is that, do you think that's roof timber? Yeah, I would say so. It certainly looks like it. Brilliant. And then a little bit further on, we've got what looks like a, the daub from a clay wall, which has collapsed, and you can see where the wattle yes, was in yeah. there, and that's burnt out. So all the charcoal in that, in that brown is actually the, the wattles that have burnt? It is. So I'm pretty convinced we've got the eastern limit of the villa. So do you think that wattle and daub was actually on top of this, this stone, that you, effectively you've got a stone wall as a footing, 
with a wattle and daub board on top. Yeah, it certainly looks that way. Right, so it, it's burnt, and then you think then it, it's actually possibly been robbed. It's been robbed after the burning, because there are a few burnt tiles in amongst the, um, the rubble here. Right, that'd be nice if it were, because so many of the other trenches we've got have been robbed by Basil, Basil mm. Brown, in his excavations. It's nice to actually see a, a wall that looks like it's been robbed in antiquity by the Romans. So that I'd say none of this has been touched. And the day ends on another high note in number 17, the discovery of the main entrance porch, exactly where Carenza and David said it would be. Well, those corners go down, that looks pretty good, doesn't it? That's spectacular, <laughs> spectacular, Stuart. Um, well, it more or less speaks for itself, it does, doesn't it? it? We thought it might go that way. There's a lot this, yeah, so what this confirms here, this, this wall corner here, is that corner of the building. We thought yeah. it might be that corner, but it's actually that corner there, it is, isn't, isn't it? it? Has Which, to be. It's, it's, this is actually one of the key excavations on, on the whole site, finding this, because yeah, it allows us to understand what was found all those years ago. Right. Um, um, and significantly, this is the main porch into, into oh, the right. villa complex. So if you turn around and walked up your garden, you'd be, you'd be walking right. into the villa. What's it feel like to have the main entrance in your back garden? Oh, it feels great. Yeah, VIPs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this substantial corner is the last piece of a particularly vexing archaeological jigsaw puzzle. Our 12 trenches in eight different gardens and the exhaustive work done by David and Carenza can now tell the story of the Castle Hill Villa. It started as a wooden barn-like structure in the first century AD, before a more substantial stone building with a bathhouse at the west was built during the late second century. Finally, the villa design was refined in the late third century, with a new separate bathhouse and other outbuildings. This last villa stretched from number 21 to number 11 Tranmere Grove, with its main reception room, the triclinium, under number 13, complete with a state-of-the-art underfloor heating system. It may not be quite the massive villa complex we expected to find, but hey, size isn't everything. Although maybe if it had been a bit bigger, we wouldn't have had to dig so many trenches to find it. These back gardens, look pretty much like they did 50 years ago when the whole place was a building site. Don't worry though, we will put them all back together again. It has been worth it though, because our eight homeowners can now say not only that they live on top of a Roman villa, but precisely which wall or corridor or porch is under their lawn. Well, if you want to find out more about archaeology that hasn't been basalt, log on to discoverychannel.co.uk slash time team. Coming up next, Battlefield remembers the Battle for Corn. Thank you.